1 Corinthians chapter 12. And again, this is uh, part number four of the gospel of the uncircumcision. But I had a question with regard to the dispensation of grace and uh, what seems to be a confusing chapter, and that is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. From this chapter, many of the uh, charismatics get the idea that uh, the gift of tongues is still in effect today. And there are also many grace people that believe that the so-called spiritual gifts mentioned here are uh, at work and are given and bestowed by God the Holy Spirit. Uh, understand this is just, just a smidgen loud. We need to cut back on the overall volume just a, just a little bit. All right. Uh, however, that is not the case. We believe that there are only two so-called supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit given in the dispensation of grace at this point. And uh, they are the gift of evangelist, as is found in Ephesians chapter 4, and the gift of pastor teacher. There are no other supernatural gifts given. Now what we have here uh, on the top and <clears throat> the straight lines all the way down are uh, pretty much a representation of the dispensation of grace. But you have to understand this in relation to what God has done, what God is doing during this dispensation. Uh, there are some things that he has done from the get-go, from day one. There are some things that he did temporarily, and there are some things that he is continuing to do today. And it affects our understanding of the word uh, when we understand that some things were done in a transitional period. And so, therefore, uh, to understand this uh, means that when we come to books like 1 Corinthians, uh, which uh, were written during this transition period, we can understand exactly what Paul is talking about, what is for us uh, permanently, what is uh, temporarily given. Okay, now we have here the dispensation of grace, starting, of course, with the salvation of Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And uh, it ends, of course, then with uh, what is known as the rapture of the church, where everyone that is saved in this dispensation goes up in the air. You say, well, pastor, how can that be? Many are dead. Yes, that's true. But you understand that Paul said the souls of them which sleep in Jesus, those that are dead in Christ from the point of Paul's salvation to the point of the rapture uh, are already in heaven. Those souls will Christ bring with him to the clouds of the air. He will then raise their bodies first. So you see, their bodies are still in the ground. Then we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. They will be reunited with their bodies and their bodies will be changed and glorified. Those uh, that are alive and remain shall be glorified as they go up. But it is a catching up together. So we're dealing with the whole of the dispensation of grace from glorious appearing to glorious appearing, from Saul's salvation to the last person that is to be a member of the body of Christ. Okay, the second thing that we need to understand is that there is something called the universal church. In Ephesians chapter 1, God sat Christ at his right side for the third time in sequence. At that point, he gave him to be head over the body of Christ, the church, which is his body. That is called the mystical church, or that sounds sort of spooky, the church of the mystery, or the universal church. Now, what we mean by the universal church is everyone saved during the dispensation of grace. They are part of the mystical church or the church of the mystery or the universal church. They are part of the body of Christ. There are no unsaved members of the body of Christ. And God the Holy Spirit uh, guarantees that fact. There are, however, unsaved members of local churches. People pull the wool over the eyes of other people saying they're saved and they're not and become members of these churches and, and so forth. But with regard to the actual body of Christ itself, there are no 
unsaved members. Only those who have believed in Christ are made members of this body. Now, the thing that we need to realize here with the universal church is that it is being formed. As we speak, people are getting saved, and uh, those people are added to the body of Christ. It is not totally formed yet. Uh, we would uh, liken this to the uh, a babe in the womb who is conceived. Well, uh, at that point, just a couple of cells <laughs> that have uh, divided. But eventually it begins to grow and you have the eyes and the head and the ears and the hands and so forth being seen. And then the body is fully developed and finally when everything is, is right and old enough to sustain itself outside of the mother's womb, uh, the body comes forth as complete. Now, in the chapter that we're going to read, we're going to see some organs of the body. God, the Holy Spirit, is, is forming the body of Christ in the, in the universal sense. Now, it does have some local applications, but you have to understand that first and foremost, he is forming the body of Christ for a specific purpose in eternity future. It is not totally formed yet. Okay, now, it is formed by something that we call the baptism by the Holy Spirit, all right? And that baptism places each and every uh, one of us into this body. Now, the interesting uh, thing about this is that it makes us positionally in Him, be the reason I say that is, uh, is God the Holy Spirit has a place for you and for me. But the fact is, I can still see you. You're a member of the body, but I still see you here in a local assembly, in a local grace assembly. Uh, so it is, it is something that is positional. Then if we were to die, we'd go into the presence of the Lord. It still basically is positional until we get our glorified bodies. Then it is completed and we rule and reign, uh, reign with Christ in the heavenlies. But a second thing about this is that it is non-experiential. Now you might get saved and you might feel emotional. You might shed a tear. You, you might not. What difference does it make if you cry or not when you get saved? The point is, did you believe? If you did, you sa you're saved. If you didn't, you're still lost. Now, that ought to be the situation for crying if you're still in your sins and have a potential to go to hell. But being placed in the body of Christ is non-experiential. Now again, the charismatics would say, no, no, no. Uh, you speak with tongues and you get this euphoric feeling. You get the rosy glow. You get the, uh, uh, the, the shakes. It's all emotional. And you weep and you cry. Uh, tears of repentance and so forth. Or tears of joy, what have you. Uh, but it doesn't make a bit of difference. It doesn't add to your salvation if you cry. It doesn't add to your salvation if you get emotional. Now, you may have joy. That's wonderful. That's, that's an emotion. But again, the point that I'm making is that once you believe God the Holy Holy Spirit uh, positionally places you in Christ and it's totally non-experiential. You didn't see it, you didn't feel it, though you might have felt good at your salvation because of joy and gratitude. All right, so it is this that God the Holy Spirit has been doing since the Apostle Paul. Who was the first member of the body of Christ physically? Well, you say Jesus Christ. He was not. His body, the body that came forth as the son of David, as the son of Abraham, is not a member of the body of Christ. Now, I hope we all understand that here. Uh, uh, if I were to preach this probably in many grace churches, that two bodies of Christ. Oh, come on. And yet that's exactly what we have. The body that died on the cross and the body that's going to rule throughout the heavenly places. One is a physical body like this. The other is a group of physical bodies uh, uh, as we have a, a student body, a governing body, or what have you. But there are some similarities. There are people that will be placed in this body in an anatomical sense, like an eye, a hand, a foot, and so forth. Uh, and that's what God the Holy Spirit is doing. Now, you have to understand then 
that during the dispensation of grace, we have something formed that is not found in any other dispensation. And you know what that is? A local grace church. Do you know in the dispensation of innocence, there was no grace church like you have here? In the dispensation of conscience, do you know where you met? Well, if you wanted to be saved toward the end of it, you met, you met with Noah at, uh, at the ark. Uh, but uh, the ark didn't have stained glass windows. The ark didn't have a steeple. Uh, you know, there was no local assembly there. You met him at an altar where uh, uh, Noah, your representative priest, your patriarchal priest, would offer a sacrifice to God. During the dispensation of human government, same, same deal. Promise, law. Now, under law, synagogues were formed. But synagogues are simply small temples or tabernacles. They, they are in essence a place where the Jews would worship because they couldn't make the trek into Jerusalem uh, every week uh, on the Sabbath day. They were only allowed to go so far. It's called a Sabbath day's journey. Uh, so they couldn't get, so what they did was have uh, Orthodox ordained rabbis to teach Judaism in a synagogue. Now that's about as close as you can get to what we have today in a, in a local grace church. But with the Apostle Paul, we have the founding of something unique. And then, by the way, this is why I get so frustrated with parachurch organizations. You know, today we have a movement sweeping the, the country. It's called the Promise Keepers and, and other various things. And you know what happens? All those people get excited about Jesus Christ, supposedly, in a football stadium instead of a local church. One shot deal in a football stadium where, where you've got uh, you know, a million man march there and a hoop hoop hooray, we're all gonna serve Jesus. And they go back home and they do not come to a local grace church with their time, their talent, and their treasure. I say it's wrong. I say that God's plan for this dispensation is a local Pauline grace church where doctrine is taught systematically and consistently by a Christ-ordained pastor-teacher. When he ascended and started grace, he gave gifts to men, and those gifts today are evangelists. They put people into the body of Christ, and pastor-teacher, they put the mind of Christ into his, into his local expression. Now, that is God's will. It's not that you can't have a conference and a convention and so forth, but it's for the building up of the body of Christ and especially the local expression, not taking people from constantly. All right, so um, I've gotten off my soapbox here and I'm going to uh, tell you that there are local churches. Now, those local churches have saved people in them and unsaved people people who are actually members of the body of Christ, and people who are fakers. All right, so here is the dispensation of grace. During the dispensation of grace in its early years, before Paul completed his canon of scripture, there were things such as supernatural gifts given, and we'll see them listed here. And they functioned. But once the canon of Scripture is complete, God simply uses the natural gifts. In other words, God the Holy Spirit placed you into the body and you have a certain genetic composition. And he placed you into the body of Christ knowing full well how you are. And uh, uh, some, as, um, as we heard this morning, some are, are, uh, tend to be uh, tender and compassionate and so forth. Uh, some uh, stand firm and that sort of thing. There, there is a composite makeup of, of the body of Christ. But all of us are to conform to the mind of Christ, His Word, and all of us are to be empowered by the Holy Spirit so that the natural gifts we have cannot function unless we are supernaturally empowered so that the emphasis becomes the filling of the Holy Spirit for any natural member of the body of Christ. Now, we were supernaturally placed into the body, but God didn't alter our personalities when he did that. The only thing he alters is the old sin nature goes, you see. 
And that is he wants us to function now as we will function when in the resurrected body with no old sin nature. So you and I have gifts. Now, with the two exceptions, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, they are natural gifts. And God wants you to use how you are naturally. But here's the catch. You have to learn doctrine. You have to be filled with the Spirit. If you are not, it doesn't matter how sweet you are. It, it doesn't matter how compassionate you are. It doesn't matter how firm you are in your stand for the truth, you know, and, and so forth. In other words, a pastor doing that. It doesn't matter. The only thing that counts is, were you filled with the Spirit, and were you acting in accordance to doctrinal orthodoxy? Okay. So that is the norm for the dispensation of grace. So let's, uh, let's go to uh, chapter 12. And verse number 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Okay, two things. Once the body of Christ is completed, you will absolutely benefit every member of that body. Why? Because we will all be united at that point. You see, there are people that are not yet saved that are going to be part of that body. You can be functioning in the spirit right now, but you have absolutely no effect on them at this moment. You're not united to them. They're not part of the body of Christ. Now, you're still to live your Christian way of life. However, you have to understand that there are only certain ones in the body and that mainly God is interested at this point in the local expression of your Christianity. As you're alive in time, he wants you to live for him. But, however, you have to keep in mind that you're living to perform a definite function in the overall body of Christ when we are united together at the point of the rapture and you will serve a function, whether it is uh, the eye, the hand, uh, the foot, or what have you. But he wants you to serve him now, locally. So let's read. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. To one is given the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kind of tongues in the interpretation of tongues. Point. Those things were given as bona fide gifts during the pre-canon period of grace. Once you have the completed canon of Scripture, you no longer need tongues, the interpretation of tongues, and the like. If any charismatic wants to go to a mission field today, what's the first thing he has to do? He has to go to, go to school and learn the language. I always, I, I'm glad to point this out always to charismatics because I always say, isn't that a bit hypocritical? That you believe in tongues and you're going to go to the mission field and yet you have to learn the language? Where's the supernatural gift? I mean, why can't you arrive from day one and speak the language fluently? Well, you've got to go to language school. Why? They didn't on the day of Pentecost. They were all Galileans. They didn't know all of the languages, let alone the individual dialects. And they knew them perfectly. But you have to learn the language. That is the biggest nonsense, biggest uh, hypocritical action in the world. All right. But, the, but all these work that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now you have to remember again, God the Holy Spirit does two things. Upon salvation, he places us as members of the body of Christ. But then he also recognized at this point that Paul hadn't written all of his letters that Paul hadn't gotten to, to all of the Christians uh, there and, and established them. There were times when they had to wait for him to settle some theological questions and then get back with them and the like. Now, he had the answers, but you have to understand uh, it, it wasn't as though he could hop on a plane and be there in an hour. He, ha he had to travel. 
So there were supernatural gifts given during this time. Now, rather than focus on that, the Apostle Paul then brings us back to the what uh, the norm or what is actually uh, the uh, function of the Holy Spirit and our function during this time. For as the body is one and has many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. Now, the point here though that we have to recognize is we are living on this side of the rapture. Yes, there are members of the body. Some members of the body are disembodied members. You know that? What do I mean by that? Some are dead. They, uh, their bodies are corrupting in the ground. They've turned to dust. Certainly you don't think that the Apostle Paul's body has been mummified and preserved and we can go and he looks exactly the same as he did when the day he died. Now that would be, that'd really be a trick because they cut his head off. Uh, and uh, so it, it's not the same, you see. But there is a universal body and everybody is placed there positionally. But there is also a local expression of the universal body. In other words, God the Holy Spirit placed you in this body according to what he knows to be your uh, genetic function and composition. Verse number 13. There are some changes. We'll see them here. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Point I want to make is this is the baptism that is for us today. We've been learning on Wednesday nights as we've been going through uh, Roman Catholicism, we'll see it even more so this Wednesday, regarding baptismal regenerationists. That you meet the blood of Christ when you meet the waters of baptism, or that you are saved, or in, uh, grace is infused in your soul when you are baptized. The point is, that is absolutely false. You are baptized into the body of Christ when you simply believe in Christ. It is a positional baptism into the body. It is not experiential. However, note, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, there is a genetic alteration. What, it, what do I mean by that? If you're a Jew, it doesn't matter. You still lose your Jewish distinctiveness and become part of the body in which there is neither Jew nor Gentile. If you're a Gentile, it doesn't matter. You are made a member of the body of Christ. That part is altered. However, let's read on. Verse number 14. For the body is not one member, but many. Now we have a difference in the, in the gifts. You'll note... One is speaking in tongues, one is the interpretation of tongues, one is doing this and the other uh, supernaturally during the pre-canon uh, period. But what is God the Holy Spirit doing in every generation of the dispensation of grace? Verse number 15. If the foot shall say, now let me ask you this. Is the foot a supernatural attachment on your body? Okay. Behold, I am not the hand. I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Let me ask you this. Is your hand a supernatural attachment to, uh, to your body? Is it something that God gave you after you came from the womb? Or is it something that was formed naturally in the natural process of bodily formation uh, in the womb? It's natural. And that's what God the Holy Spirit is doing. If the ear shall not say, because I'm not the eye, am I not of the body? Again, these are natural endowments. So God, the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to form the body of Christ. And I need, uh, I need uh, skin cells. I need ears. I need hands. I need fingers and so forth. And so he simply places us as we are into the body of Christ. It is, a, it is a supernatural thing. He does it, but it is a natural placement. It's the, the body is, uh, uh, the eye wasn't uh, uh, placed uh, here uh, uh, just simply by whim. It has a purpose. It has a function. 
Uh, aren't you glad that you don't have an eye coming out the back of your neck and so forth? Uh, and and uh, eight arms instead of just two? How, how ugly that would be. So let's read on. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? The whole were the hearing, where were the smelling? Now God has set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. That's the point. You have to make a distinction between some of the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit that were manifest in local churches during the pre-canon period of Scripture and the formation of the body of Christ and where the Holy Spirit has placed you. So as you are naturally kind, tender, now we all should have these virtues, but there are propensities in our makeup. We need to be filled with the Spirit, and where we are manifested in time, we need to function accordingly, because that's going to be part of our function eternally when we are seated with Christ and rule and reign with Him in the heavenlies. Okay, let's move on. Verse 19. I, and as I look, I see furrowed brows again. I, uh, some uh, absolutely do not know what in the world it is I'm talking about. You know, we just love Jesus. That's all. I, I just I just love Jesus. You know, as though as though some emotional experience of loving Jesus is going to net you the Christian way of life. It takes understanding his word. OK, sometimes the tough part. If they were all one member, then where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. Now, here we come down to verse number 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Do you know uh, um, that I'm, I might be looking at an eye here, a, um, a lip, a foot, or a hand um, in, as a member of the body of Christ. Uh, only God the Holy Spirit knows exactly where He has placed you. But you are members in particular, and you have a definite function in the body. Now, all of a sudden, the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, writes... Not of the natural members of the body. He is writing of some of the supernatural gifts given to the natural members of the body during the pre-canon period. And God has set some in the church. First apostles, then prophets, then, uh, then pastor teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helps, and so forth. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gift of healing, do all speak with tongues, and so forth? And the answer to that is absolutely not. But it has to do simply with the fact that Corinthians was, was written, uh, 1 Corinthians was written around 59 A.D. Now, we only have Galatians written, and we only have First and Second Thessalonians written at this particular time. All the rest of the books of the Apostle Paul were written later. And, uh, and so therefore, it's a pre-canon period. Yes, from Genesis to Malachi, they were written. And some of the so-called uh, gospel books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. However, it's the Pauline books that determine and dictate doctrine for us during the dispensation of grace in what is called a post-canon period. Now... Those gifts that were mentioned that are temporary, you'll, you'll see these, um, these little uh, teepees uh, there. What they are are expressions of the local church in every generation of the dispensation of grace. I hope that I am not misleading anybody when uh, uh, I say to you, you're not always going to be alive on this planet. And that there are other grace believers that are going to take your place. And that has happened down through the, the, the dispensations. There were some grace believers that had temporary spiritual gifts. But now... You have, you have a gift in that you are gifted naturally. God gave you a genetic composition. 
And so in every dispensation represented by these, uh, the, by these TPs here, in every dispensation there is a manifestation of the body of Christ locally. But it's God the Holy Spirit using His power and the Word of God to use you as you are. You are a foot. You are a, a hand. Some are pain in the necks. And some have lower manifestations of their pain uh, or giving pain uh, to other bodily members. But uh, I just had to throw that in. That's, you know, you understand. Okay. But the point is, if you are saved, you are in the body. Now, if you are sanctified or spirit-filled, you are or should manifest yourself in that way with the eye function, the ear function. Uh, we heard going to be a better listener. Well, what, what is that? The ears listen. They're mentioned here as part of the body of Christ. Okay, I, I've gone to preach, and I think I've gone over my time. I, oh, I still have just a few minutes. We'll, we'll, um, we'll recap and, uh, and let you go. This, this is, uh, and I realize this is absolutely a difficult lesson to learn because you say, well, Pastor, the, this is in the Bible. And I say, yeah, it's in the Bible, but you have to understand where in time these things applied. There are only two supernatural gifts extant in the dispensation of grace past the post-canon period of Scripture. Evangelist and pastor teacher. Period. So you don't have to say, well, I wonder what my spiritual gift is. Forget that. God the Holy Spirit doesn't give them anymore. But I'll tell you what you can wonder about. You can wonder about how you are in accordance with the Word of God, how you're genetically composed, being filled with the Spirit and applying His Word to your life. In that way, you will uh, manifest yourself. Say you're living at this point. The body of Christ is manifesting itself on the earth as it will, as a member of that overall body in eternity future. You are manifesting yourself as a member of the body during time. Once time is over, the rapture occurs, the body will be completed anatomically. And at that point, however you are, it's going to be incorporated into the overall body of Christ, and that is how you'll function. That is how you will benefit every other member of, of the body.